Praise God. Well, we've had a break, a little bit of a break for the holiday season, and we celebrated Christmas twice here at Faith Christian Center. We actually missed on Christmas Day due to the extreme storm that passed through the area. So we had Christmas service on New Year's Day. It was pretty awesome. And, uh, hey, we don't mind right here saying uh, that every day is Christmas. Because really, what is Christmas? It's a gathering to celebrate Christ. And that's what we like to do. do. You know, that's where he said, that's when he actually says, when we gather two or three in his name, he's in our midst. So that's why we really enjoy our gatherings, our fellowship, and our time together. And we don't care if it's two, three, seven hundred, eight hundred, or a thousand. Uh, as long as we're together in his name, we have joy, peace uh, that passeth all understanding. And even in the midst of the storms that we see in the world. You know, we, uh, we've talked about in the past about we're doing two, two teachings on Wednesday night. The first is our study of Revelation, which we're doing a lengthy introduction, which actually could, we mentioned this before, could actually be uh, titled something other than Revelation Introduction because it's more of an uh, introduction to eschatology. And uh, eschatology is the study of last things, which would include all of the things in the Bible about the last days, which is a great deal of Scripture. Well, uh, we're covering that, but oftentimes we're finding that those two teachings, even though we're doing Revelation in the first class, and Psalm one week and Daniel the next week in the second class, they all seem to uh, be interchangeable because we're, our topics are, are coming to be uh, such that uh, we are discussing the last days more and more because we're in them. And uh, it's, it's very easy to see that when we look around. We're going to discuss a couple of uh, different articles this afternoon in the, or this evening in the second class that I encourage you to tune into. Um, they are on the website, so you can go read those at your leisure. But there's just something different about when you actually read through it live and you can stop and make comments about it and why you thought what you thought and things of that nature. So uh, let's head into our study tonight with prayer. Lord, we thank you that you've given us a wonderful uh, holiday season in, t in which time we've celebrated Christ, Lord. And with Lord Jesus, we thank you that you did choose to come, to come to that manger to go from there to the cross, and thank you, Lord, that you resurrected, and you now sit at the right hand of the Father, interceding for all of us. And we thank you, Lord, that one day soon you'll return for us. And that's what we're looking for, and that's why we're teaching what we're teaching, because we know that your coming is soon, and we are, we are doing our best to be prepared for that moment when you call us into the air. And we bless you, Lord. We thank you for all you do. And we thank you, Lord, that you're here tonight. And it, I ask you, Lord, to bless me in the way that I could teach what you would have me to teach, that you would just use me as a vessel. Lord, allow your anointing to flow through me. In Jesus' name, that your word would be understood. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have been on a, a bit of a trek here d discussing the differences between Israel and the church and the we're still going to cover some more on that tonight, and here's why. It's vital. If we don't have this piece of this eschatological, Rhapsody says this word's really hard to read, and it's hard to say too, eschatological. If we don't have that piece of the puzzle in place properly, we're going to be all confused. We'll be upside down. We'll be thinking what pertains to Israel pertains to the church and vice versa. And a simple study of the various pieces and parts of each help us understand what we're reading when we do our study through the book of Revelation, Daniel, Ezekiel, and the various end times uh, passages. So last week we left off uh, talking about the differences between Israel and the church in our chart. And I had mentioned uh, before we get started tonight, I had mentioned I was going to try to get these online and I was trying to do that, but it took me all the way till today to find out where I got the chart. And I don't like to put anything on if I can't give credit to whomever has created it. And I finally did find out today who created it, and I will put that online. Um, and this way, you will have uh, reference to the creator of the chart. Now, I will say this: as uh, I will say this about that. About that, anything I post does not mean I agree with everything that that person posts. 
If I use somebody's stuff and I give them credit, it doesn't mean that we agree on everything. Because there are certain things that um, we look at Scripture and people read one thing out of it and, and we read another thing and we say, well, we don't agree on that and it's okay, but we're, what we're supposed to do then is study that out. But oftentimes we use something from someone's uh, different part of the world or maybe even deceased. So I just want to say, I'm going to preface anything that you see on the website that's given credit to from someone else, then know that we're just using that item. Okay? I think I said that, and I hope I didn't make that. That's probably about as clear as mud, isn't it, Brother Lee? Okay. So, in our differences, now what I'm going to do before, previously, last week we, we cited the difference and then we read the, the passages. Now that I'm going to be placing the chart online, we're not going to read the passages tonight. We're just going to cite the differences, and then we're going to read some um, articles from some experts in this area and let them fill in the blanks for us. So we, we know that Israel has never spiritually been baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's a viewed as a future event in the Gospels in the Old Testament. We do know for the church that all believers are spiritually baptized by the Holy Spirit. And we go back to Israel. The Holy Spirit would come and go selectively. You remember in their time? Uh, the Holy Spirit would come upon them, or they, He would come upon them and they would prophesy. And he would come and go. Well, with us, that's not the same, because we believers have a universal indwelling and sealing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, once He comes in, He's there uh, till, the, till the Lord comes and gets us. I mean, that's one, that's one of those things. He doesn't come and go with us. Now, we might often think that, where did He go? Uh, Rhapsody had a season in her life where she thought uh, the Lord lifted his presence for three days. Of course, he didn't leave, but he let her feel that way for a purpose. So the scripture says he will do what? Never leave nor forsake us. Never means never. It means never. <laughs> now, we we'll go back to Israel. They are not blessed with all spiritual blessings. However, new believers in Christ uh, in the New Testament, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings as we see in Ephesians 1, 3, Colossians 2, 10, and 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. Uh, now, re going back to Israel, they uh, related to the day of the Lord. We see in Joel, Joel 2, Zephaniah 2, Zechariah 12 through 14. They're related to the day of the Lord. We, as New Testament believers, we are related to the day of Christ. 1 Corinthians, Philippians, and we, so the difference is we, they're related to the day of the Lord, and we're related to the day of Christ. Uh, they have an earthly temple. We have a heavenly temple. Remember, they built more than one temple, and in fact, they're preparing now to build a third temple. Um, we, however, believe in an, a heavenly temple. Also, the believer is embodied by the Holy Spirit, making us what? We are the temple of God on earth. Now, that refers to the next point. Israel, their temple is a building. Remember, uh, Scripture tells us that God says He will not, no longer dwell in a building made with, with man's hands. Well, now he, he is dwelling within us, the body that He made. See, He remade us. At our, we are new creatures in Christ. So now God, because of that, comes in in the form of the Holy Spirit and indwells us. In, the, in Israel, they had a select priesthood, the Levites. Well, in the church, we have a universal priesthood. And this is what um, got uh, Luke, Luther in hot water with the, the Catholic church because they didn't want men to believe. And I'm going to say it just like I said it. They did not want men to believe that they were priests of God. They didn't want men to believe that they individually could consult God. Why? Because it kept, kept men coming to them. Uh, that's direct uh, fulfillment of Paul's words that, that uh, men would do what? Do things to draw men unto them. See, their whole goal is to draw men unto them. They've created a works-based theology, which uh, sadly, unless people are, if those involved, if they don't accept Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, which many have, they will not go in the rapture. And then at that point, they'll have a choice. Do I just double down and stay with my works-based church and become part of that uh, 
whore of Babylon church, the, the false church of the tribulation, or do I repent, call upon the name of the Lord, and begin to testify, because we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So his blood has been shed for our salvation. Now we must believe and confess him. And that's what's going to happen in the tribulation to many who thought they were going to heaven, but they were trusting in man's ideas of what salvation was. We're not saved by man or going and repenting to man. It doesn't save us. What saves us is calling upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if, if you're out there and you're hearing this, and uh, for whatever reason you tuned in just right now, and you're hearing this and you've been working on, working on your building, trying to work your way into heaven, forsake that. You can't work. Now, you will do good works after salvation because that's what we, comes out of us just naturally. Because once we're saved, we begin to do good works. And, uh, but those good works are not what saved us. It's what Christ did. That's the whole crux of this here biscuit. Christ paid it all. Our job is to believe. It's really pretty simple, isn't it? It's like peanut butter and jelly. He did the peanut butter and we're doing the jelly. You put them together and you got wow. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> now, don't give me any comments. He said, Jesus is peanut butter. <laughs> Well, peanut butter is my favorite thing. So, there you go. All right. Now, in the Old Testament with Israel, they had many animal sacrifices. These animal sacrifices had to go and go and go and go. As a matter of fact, that's why they want to rebuild the temple now, because they want to get back to their sacrifices. Because when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, guess what stopped? Their animal sacrifices. They want that desperately. Well, the problem is they are those who rejected Christ because Christ was the perfect sacrifice. And his one final sacrifice on the cross paid the price even for them should they just stop the madness and believe. And they will at some point, but not yet. In the Old Testament, the Israelites had earthly promises. We have heavenly promises. In the Old Testament, the Israelites had Old Testament revelation. We have Old Testament mystery. Okay, so the mysteries that were in the Old Testament are now being revealed in us is what that's meaning. The Jew and the Gentile distinction. They had Jews and Gentiles. In the New Testament, there's no distinction. Remember, there's no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female. Once we're in Christ, we are the bride of Christ. We are one entity. Now, we still walk the earth as a male and a female. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not all gender confused here. I know that I, God gave me this beard on my face because I'm a man. Just saying. My wife says, I wish you'd shave that thing. I said, well, well one of these days I will. It's winter. <laughs> I like it myself. I like a beard. All right. We, in the, the Jews, they had a, their, their circumcision was, was human. And our circumcision is without hands because it's a circumcision of the heart. So there's a big difference. We're circumcised in heart. See, you can, that only happens when you believe. All right? So the problem with the, the former, the Israelites we're talking about here, versus the, the Christian, or Israelite, Israel and the church, which is what we're really trying to differentiate here, is that one is dealing literally with the flesh, and the other is dealing with spirit. The Israelites will experience the tribulation. Remember that the purpose of the tribulation is the salvation of the Jewish nation. However, the church will escape the tribulation. We see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We will escape that. And people call us, oh, you're escapist. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. If you knew the ship you were on was sinking, and if you stayed on it and you, you were going to drown, would you try to get off the ship? Uh, yeah. That's exactly, or, or if you were in a building that was burning and you knew that if you didn't leave, you were going to die, what would you do? You would try to escape. Well, God in his graciousness has provided a way through belief in Christ for us to escape that which is coming. The ones that are going to tribulate are those who rejected that blessed hope. The 
See, because that blessed hope of ours is that He is coming back to get us. Praise God. Now, we go back to the Israelites. They, they are looking for the revelation of Jesus Christ at the welling well. They're still looking for their Messiah. Well, the problem is He, he came 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years ago. But we are looking, the church is looking, we're looking for the rapture of the, of the church by Jesus Christ. See, they're looking for Him to come. We're looking for Him to take us back to the Father's house. And they're... The thing is, and I'll go ahead, I may get out of order here, but when they actually do have him come, it'll be the second coming in which we will come back with Christ at the end of the tribulation. So their lineage, the Israelites, started with Abraham. Ours, the church, started at Pentecost. The Israelites rejected Christ. The church received Christ. Uh, Israel involves one nation, and the church involves many nations. The Israelites mixed mixed people, believers and unbelievers. Only there are only believers in the true church. Now, there, that doesn't mean that an unbeliever won't come into the church. That happens. But I'm saying that what makes the church the body, the entity which Christ will come back for, only has true believers. And by the way, the only true believers are going to lift off the ground. It's kind of like um, an airplane. If it, ha- if it doesn't have jet fuel, if it's a jet, it's not leaving the ground. Okay? Uh, so you have to be of the proper components, if you will. And the church is made up of whom? True believers. And remember, believing is what gets you into the church to begin with. Now, Israelites fell out of favor with God, and, and this, this was shown in great... Um, in a great way, and at the destruction of the temple, which, by the way, Christ prophesied while he was still walking the earth. And we, the church, we enjoy the blessings of God. Israel is promised a land. We, the church, are promised no land. Israel has been set aside temporarily. We, the church, have been grafted in presently, meaning, and the reason I say it that way, or the reason this person says it that way, and I agree, is that Scripture tells us that, hey, if, if the true vine, the natural vine, Israel, was cast aside, how much more, or how easy would it be for the, uh, we're not the true vine, we are grafted in vine to be cast aside. So that's why it's, it says it, that we are grafted in presently. So how do we stay grafted in? We abide. As long as we abide in him, remember, he's the vine, we are the branches. We stay grafted in by abiding in Him. If we step outside of that and begin to believe in our own will, our own ways, and begin to think that works are work, what's, uh, well, then that's when we get in trouble, and then we can be found to, to bear no fruit, and then we will actually go to the point of withering up, drying, and then we will be what? Gathered up and cast into the fire. Not a good place to be. So we want to stay grafted in by abiding in Christ. It's really pretty simple. Now, the Israelites have had specific dietary laws, and we can eat uh, whoppers, and ham, or pork chops. Because the scripture tells us that whatsoever he has made clean is clean. Uh, we had, they had special holy days. We have no special holy days. You know, there's a big schism about Saturday, Sunday, Sabbath, and what's this day, and the Sunday, and the... So, Here's the reality for the Christian. Every day is the day of the Lord. Every day. We just happen to gather on Sunday. And by the way, that was actually what they did in the early church. They gathered on Sunday. Maybe it was because the building was empty. Maybe the Jews gathered on Saturday. I don't know. Just throwing that out there. Maybe that's the time when they could get to places and do things. So... That ends our chart. Now, what I, like I said, I will, I will upload this chart, and you can go through and actually reread the points, bullets we, we t- talked about very briefly tonight, and then you can go act- actually read the passages, and you saw how long it took last week. We got maybe four or five bullets done, and it took the whole hour. So that's why I'm encouraging you to t- take some of this study at home, and uh, that'll bring you right up to where we are 
and we're about to, we're about to launch into this study of the book of Revelation, but I do still have a few points I want to clarify before we get there. Now tonight we're going to cover an article. This is called The Wife of Jehovah and the Bride of Messiah, and this is written by Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and uh, he's going to differentiate some of these things that we just pointed out, but he's going to do so in, um, in text so we can gain a better understanding. So, there are certain key distinctions in the Scriptures. If one does not understand these biblical distinctions, the Scriptures become contradictory because one part of the Bible says, you may, and another says, you may not, concerning the very same subject. One of these key biblical distinctions is the one between Israel and the church. In the Bible, Israel is represented as the wife of Jehovah, whereas the church is represented as the bride of Christ, Messiah. A failure to maintain that distinction will only result in a misrepresentation of what the Scriptures teach. Israel, the wife of Jehovah. The relationship of Israel as the wife of Jehovah is viewed throughout the Scriptures in various ways and facets. This relationship can be broken down into six distinct stages. Stage one, the marriage contract. The entire format of the book of Deuteronomy is that of both an ancient treaty and an ancient marriage contract. In this book, Moses took all the various facets of the three earlier books and presented them in the form of an ancient marriage contract. In this book, we find the marriage contract signed between Israel and God, whereby Israel becomes the wife of Jehovah. There are key passages that demonstrate how the book of Deuteronomy fits into the scheme of a marriage contract. The first passage is found in Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 3, which declares that God entered into a covenant with His people Israel out at Mount Sinai. As it will be seen later in the study, the Jewish prophets always viewed this covenant relationship as a marriage contract. In Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 15, God announces His jealousy over His wife Israel. You shall fear Jehovah your God, and Him shall you serve, and shall swear by His name. You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people that are round about you. For Jehovah your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Lest the anger of Jehovah your God be kindled against you, and He destroy you from off the face of the earth. Wow. In this passage, Israel is warned against committing... Now, let me, let me just take a little break there. Now, this is Israel, whom God is making a marriage contract with. And he's saying, hey, you mess up, I'm going to destroy you. And we have people today saying, you can't mess up. It's impossible. One saved, always saved crowd. Oh, it's, just, it's impossible to mess up. Really? We just talked about abiding. If we stop abiding, don't get me wrong, God is always just on his part. He doesn't change here. He doesn't change now. We are the ones, just like in the very beginning with Adam and Eve, guess what they did? They chose to disobey God's law. What was, they had one law, one rule, don't eat of that tree. <laughs> ah. So, back to the article. In this passage, Israel is warned against committing adultery through the worship of other gods because God's burning jealousy will be kindled against her and will eventually cause her expulsion out of the land. Ezekiel was one example of the Jewish prophets who viewed this covenant relationship as a marriage contract. Now when I passed by you and looked upon you, behold, your time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Yea, I swore unto you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord Jehovah, and ye became mine. You know, the thought that comes to mind there is Boaz and when he spread his cape over Naomi. See, that was a over Ruth, Naomi was the mother, mother-in-law. <laughs> Thanks, sister. My brain gets sometimes rolling. But Ruth, the, there was now a covenant between Boaz and Ruth. And guess what? Because of that, if you look at the lineage, therefore came Christ. So what a wonderful example. That was just a little tidbit. All right. Stage two. Now we get to the great adultery. Several Old Testament prophets described Israel's great adultery. Jeremiah 3, 1 through 5 shows Israel being guilty of playing the harlot with many lovers. In verse 
3.20, Israel is compared to a wife who has turned away from her husband. Israel was a wife guilty of adultery. Surely, as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously, treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says Jehovah. According to Jeremiah 31, 32, the original marriage contact was broken because of this adultery. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, said Jehovah. A long passage in chapter 16 of Ezekiel also describes this great adultery. And we see that you can read about that in Ezekiel 16, 15 through 34. And we also see in Hosea 2, 2 through 5, that God declares, uh, th this passage declares that God, um, what he has against Israel. And she was guilty of harlotry. Wow. Stage three, now the separation. Because of this adultery, a separation took place between God and Israel in the days of Isaiah. In Isaiah 51, God spoke to the prophet stating that God had not yet divorced his wife. If God had divorced her, he would have given her a bill of divorcement. And so, no such bill of divorcement was in hand, and it meant that a divorce had not taken place. This separation lasted approximately 100 years. Stage four, oh, here comes the divorce. The 100 years of separation failed to produce repentance. In Israel, and finally God had no other choice but to issue the bill of divorcement on the grounds of adultery. The bill of divorcement is contained in Jeremiah 3, 6 through 10. To a great extent, almost all of Jeremiah can be declared to be God's bill of divorcement of Israel, but especially this passage in chapter 3. Stage 5, the punishment. Several Old Testament prophecies speak of the punishment of Israel for her unfaithfulness. Ezekiel 16, 35-43 and Hosea 2, 6-13 are two examples. The aim of this punishment is not simply so that God could be vengeful toward Israel, but rather to cause her to stop sinning and to stop her adulteries. Also, the purpose of this punishment is to show Israel her need for her true husband and not for her false lovers. We see that in Hosea 2, verse 7b. Although God has a long program of punishment for Israel's sin, Throughout the period of punishment, there is continual a continual call for repentance. We talk about this all the time. Even the tribulation is a call for repentance. He wants them to say, uncle. <laughs> you remember when you were a kid? You get, ah, uncle. But it, he wants it to be on the, of their own free will. The call is presented. In, now really, and the reason I just said that last statement, if you think about it, God is not at this point here. He's not necessarily personally punishing them, but he's allowing their, cho their own choices. Their own choices are bringing about calamities upon them. And uh, you think about it. He says in his word, choose you this day, blessings or cursings. We choose by what we desire to, whom we desire to serve. And we see that this call that the Lord is talking about is presented in Jeremiah 3, verses 11 through 18. Stage six, the remarriage with restored blessings. Oh, the Jewish prophets did not leave things hopeless. They spoke of a day coming when Israel will again become the restored wife of Jehovah. This will require a brand new marriage contract, which is found in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. What, if, what is often known as the new covenant is, in many respects, a new marriage contract that God will make with both the houses of Israel and Judah. This new covenant of marriage will be necessary because the old covenant was broken. This remarriage contract is also described in Ezekiel 16, 60 through 63. According to Ezekiel, God will enter into an everlasting covenant with Israel in the future. The restoration of Israel as Jehovah's wife is also described in Isaiah 54, 1 through 8. And the remarriage is future described in Isaiah 62, 4 through 5. Hosea, who had much to say about the adulterers of Israel, also spoke of Israel's reunion with her husband. Hosea 2, 4 through 20, 14 through 23, describes the courtship and the wooing in the wilderness and shows the four results of this reunion. So this is why we say that the purpose of the tribulation is the salvation of the Jewish nation because out of it is going to come this remarriage to Israel. And that's why... 
again, we're going to go back to the, the initial statement. There is a distinct difference between Israel and the church. And there, the reason we have to make this point over and over again is because many have, have come to this belief that the church has replaced Israel. Not so. Two distinct entities. Now the church, remember, the church was referred to as the bride of the Messiah. What God has to say about the church and her relationship as the bride of Messiah is radically different from what, he's, what he had to say, and what, he, what he's been saying uh, regarding Israel as the wife of Jehovah. The bride of the Messiah is the universal body of true believers. And we talked about the universal body, meaning that these believers can come from any, any race, any sex. Once we become a believer in Christ, there is no race or sex. Remember, we are universal. We are believers in Christ. And that does, again, we're going back to this gender thing. It doesn't mean we, we all of a sudden become gender confused. It's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is we are now, God is what? Spirit, and we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We spiritually are this church. The local church is that portion of the universal church living in a specific geographical area. So we are, our Faith Christian Center is a local church living in Zanesville or uh, operating in Zanesville, Ohio. Most people that attend here live in Zanesville or the surrounding areas, Adamsville. And uh, we have folks from New Concord and Philo and, and various areas, but they're generally fairly close to our area. And we spoke about this at some point, I don't know where, but God has chosen in his extreme wisdom to do just this with the church, to plant us throughout the world as salt and light. In a lot of small congregations like the one here where we run anywhere from 20 to 50 or 60, depending on who all is in town at that time. And uh, there are probably 100, 150 churches here in Zanesville about the same circumstance. But guess what? We're all scattered throughout the land, and each one is, as the pastor is fond of saying, is attempting to reach one. Praise God. Not that we, have, we, we gain one for Christ and we stop. No, now we look for the next. I was an Army recruiter, and every night you'd go to bed, you could have put three in that day to the United States Army, and you would have gone to bed a hero. But the next morning you woke up a zero, because what have you done for me today? Well, that's the way God's looking at us. Son, did you reach one today? Son, daughter, did you reach one today? Praise God. But the bride of the Messiah is not limited to some local church somewhere. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, we went to a church and they, their moniker was the capital letters, Church of God of Prophecy. And what does that mean? That means they truly believe that they were the only church going. Well, Scripture doesn't square with that, saints. I'm sorry. If you go to one of those churches, you better start reading, studying, for, show yourself approved. Because guess what? You ain't it. Now, I'm not saying you're not part of it. But you ain't all that is it. And that's the problem. That, that builds a pride over what you're doing. And really, looking back at what we used to what we were taught in those days, it was all about works, essentially. How you dressed, how you talked, how you, where you went. Guess what? That does not what gets you to heaven. Now, the Lord will, in His goodness, He will cause us to be modest. Our nature will just, we'll just become modest. I mean, we're not going to run around as guys in a Speedo. I'm just saying, it's not going to happen. You know, when I go to a public area where there's water and people want to get, I just naturally put on a t-shirt. Why? It's just, I'm modest. You know, uh, so I think that's what the Lord does. He changes us, but it's not, it's not the works that changes. Oh, I have to do that. I have to do that to be in good favor with the Lord. Well, that's not what scripture teaches us. Now, it does tell us to dress modestly. So yeah, we should. But I, what I'm saying is the Lord brings those passages home and they become reality to us and we're living them not just reading and trying to to uh, imitate the word so the body of christ is a it's composed of all believers regardless of geographical location and denominational affiliation there are yeah that's right we're going to see presbyterians and we're going to see Methodists, 
and we're going to see Baptist, and we're going to see whatever else is up there, as long as they believed in Christ. There are four distinct, there are four key passages of the New Testament that speak concerning the relationship of the church as the bride of the Messiah. It must be kept in mind, however, that the church is pictured today as an engaged bride who is not yet joined by marriage to her husband. Remember, that marriage is going to take place in heaven after the rapture, before the second coming. We're not, we're betrothed. Remember, when, and we've talked about this before, I'll, I'll mention it again, a uh, good show to watch that will show this whole picture that we're getting ready to talk about here is uh, Before the Wrath. It's well done, uh, paints a great picture of, of what a Galilean wedding, which Jesus spoke about in his Upper Room Discourse, this is what we are experiencing now as the bride. We await the one, the bride, the bridegroom, who has gone to prepare a place for us in the Father's house. So this is why we are considered betrothed. Now, the espousal in 2 Corinthians 11 and 2, she says, For I am jealous over you. Paul wrote this about the church. I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I espoused you to one husband that I might present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Speaking to the local church found in the city of Corinth, Paul declares that by means of evangelism, they were espoused to one husband for the purpose of eventually being presented as a pure virgin to Christ. Unlike Israel, who was guilty of adultery, when the union comes between the Messiah and the church, the church will be presented as a pure virgin. You remember elsewhere we talk about uh, he is preparing a bride who is that's without spot nor wrinkle. And we also talk about often about how churches across the land are preparing for his coming and becoming more uh, mindful of the last days that we're in. Well, what does this do? Well, we, we refer back to our early uh, discussion about eschatology. One of the reasons for eschatology is the causes the believer to want to live a holy life. Therefore, we, we gain that crown of righteousness because we are waiting for his appearing. So that when we are waiting for his appearing, we're watching. Now, I'm not saying we're just standing here and that's all we do. But our mind is focused on what on that fact that he's coming soon. Therefore, the, the scripture that says we do all things as unto Christ bears even greater weight right now because we're thinking, man, he's watching. He's, and pastor said it recently, he said, Boy, he's, he must be on his way because we're, we're sure sensing him more and more and more. Well, that's the idea that, that we're presenting when we begin to talk about his coming. And we're not just doing it willy-nilly. This is something the Lord is doing in the hearts of men across the land. And um, why? Because he's preparing us for this moment. And guess who's going to get to heaven to be in this wedding? Only those true believers we've been talking about that abide in Christ. Oh, Oh, I get it now. So that's the, that's the one that's... See, remember, uh, and we, I'm getting way ahead of the ballgame. We have different kind of believers going to be going to heaven. We're going to have those that are raptured, then we're going to have those that are killed in the tribulation, and their spirit goes. They'll be awaiting their, re, their, their reunification with their body at the second coming, because where's their body? In the grave. Okay? So, praise God. It's going to be uh, an interesting time. We'll explain all that in detail when we get further along. <coughs> Excuse me. The process of sanctification or maturing of the bride... We see this in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The purpose of the death of the Messiah and his relationship with the church is that he might sanctify her. This is necessary in order for the church to be presented as a pure virgin as pictured in 2 Corinthians 11.2. Now, I want you to, let's look at that first line again. The purpose of the death of the Messiah 
in his relationship with the church. Remember, we don't have the ability to enter heaven without Christ. It's because of what he did. And that's why that betrothal, that's why his coming, that's why him, when Paul talked about the mystery, it's of Christ and the church, and, was, and he used the analogy of the husband and the wife, and he lays down his life. It's because that is the only way that we can be the bride, is by belief in what he did for us. Amen? So that shed blood is indeed so powerful, and it does so many things, and that's another study for another day. The church is sanctified by continual washing in the water of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is working in the church so that the true church is slowly being conformed to the Word of God. The water in this passage is not water baptism, but a description of the Word of God and its cleansing ministry. The aim of this process of sanctification and cleansing of the church is that the church might be presented a glorious virgin to the Messiah. The marriage Revelation 19, 6 through 9, the Jewish wedding system that was common in Yeshua's day had four distinct stages, which are found in the relationship of the church as the bride of the Messiah. The first stage, the father of the groom makes the arrangement for the bride and pays the bride price. In this case, the bride price was the blood of the Messiah. This was described earlier in Ephesians 5, 25 and 27. While the first stage has already been completed, the other three stages are still future. The second stage is the fetching of the bride, which that's what we await. Just as a long period of time could transpire between the first and second stages in the Jewish system, so it has been with the church. 2,000 years have passed since the first stage was accomplished. However, someday the second stage will take place when the Messiah will come in order to fetch the bride to his home. This fetching of the bride is referred to today as the rapture of the church and is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13-18. through 18. The third stage of the Jewish wedding system is the marriage ceremony to which only a few are invited. The marriage ceremony will take place in heaven just prior to the second coming of the Messiah at the end of the tribulation, and the ones who will be present are only those in heaven at that time. This is described in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 8. The fourth and final stage is the marriage feast described in Revelation 19:9. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they that are bidden to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are true words of God. Since many are bidden or invited to come to the marriage feast, this passage indicates that it will be at a different place than the marriage ceremony. We know from the word of God that the Old Testament saints are not resurrected with the church before the tribulation. They are resurrected at the end of the tribulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. John the Baptist, who was the last of the Old Testament prophets, called himself a friend of the bridegroom and did not consider himself to be a member of the bride of the Messiah, the church. Hence, the many who are bidden to attend the marriage supper on earth are all the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints resurrected after the second coming of the Messiah. While the marriage supper, correction, the marriage ceremony will take place in heaven just before the second coming of the Messiah, the marriage feast will take place on the earth after the second coming of the Messiah. In fact, it would seem that the marriage feast is what begins the millennium or the messianic age. The church's co-reigning with the Messiah will start with a tremendous marriage feast. And again, we're going to go through all of this in detail as we go through the various passages described herein. The eternal abode of the bride. In Revelation 21, verses 9 through 22, we see that the final picture that the Scriptures give of the bride of the Messiah is contained in the closing chapters of the Bible itself. In Revelation 21, 9, John states, And there came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, who were laden with the seven last plagues. And he spoke with me, saying, Come hither, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. In this passage, the bride is now the married wife. In the following verses, Revelation 21, 10 through 22 and 5, there is a graphic description of the glorious eternal wife of the Lamb in her eternal abode. Now while the distinction between Israel and the church is maintained in various ways throughout the Bible, this is one of the most picturesque. However, if one makes the wife of Jehovah, Israel, and the bride of the Messiah, the church, one and the same thing, He's faced with numerous contradictions because the different descriptions given uh, cause this contradiction. Remember, 
we go, as we go through our study, and we talked about, we did a study this last year, and it's very easy to begin to think of things that apply to Israel as, oh, that's the church. When If you did that, it throws you into a hole. And the example I like to use is if we are the church, is it, if we're Israel, then we have to go through the tribulation. Well, I don't want to go through the tribulation. Remember, we're escape artists. Uh, we, we're escapees. And we want to get out of here. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a uh, reference to the Flintstones. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, praise God. Only when the two separate entities are seen, Israel and the, is the wife of Jehovah and the church is the bride of the Messiah, do all such contradictions vanish. Praise God. So, if we keep that in mind as we go forward, we're not going to have the issues that some have of conflating Israel and the church, therefore having many difficulties in understanding eschatology. Praise God. Well, I think we're going to stop there for tonight. And I do thank you for joining. Again, uh, if you're watching online, make sure you tune into the, the second video tonight. We're going to be covering some issues that are pertinent to today and uh, what's happening in the earth in the form of a couple of different articles. So uh, God bless you, love you, and we'll see you next time.